Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Zerker, and uh, I'll be the host for Looking to the East, this session that we do every two weeks here on ThinkTech. I want to welcome you to the show, and I think we have a very interesting topic to cover uh, on this show. It has to do with international education. Those of you that have tuned into our segment before know that I'm a professor and a dean here at Kansai Gaida University. This is a, a topic that's a very personal one for me. I'm living through the COVID experience from the educational perspective right now. Um, and I have a very special guest for this show. I want to introduce to you Mike Matsuno. So Mike and I have known each other. Mike, how long did I meet you? 10 years ago? It's been yeah, quite a while. Yeah, over that. Yeah. Yeah. So off and on, our paths have crossed and his career is uh, somewhat similar, even deeper actually than mine in terms of international education. So as you can see from his background, uh, uh, even though that's virtual, he does live in Japan like I do, and he's been involved in international education in various aspects. He's involved with NAFSA and the Japan Special Interest Group that focuses on how to encourage international exchange between Japan and the United States. So, Mike, that's a partial uh, introduction. Why don't you give a little bit more background about yourself, if you don't mind? Well, thanks for having me, Steve. Um, <clears throat> I was at Osaka Gakuin University as their director of their International Center for um, 10 years as the faculty director. And I was in charge of all areas of uh, inbound and outbound. And after that, I um, worked for uh, California State University, Monterey Bay in the Asia region as their international consultant and their, um, you know, their, their person to take care of agreements and things. And finally, I am presently ending my contract at the Japan Study Abroad Foundation. And I just started working at Kinki University in their English intensive program. Right. I guess for our listeners who uh, are not familiar with Japanese universities, you know, Kinki University is not the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that. Kinki is a region in Japan. Right. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting <laughs> marketing story that I talk about in my class. Uh, it'd be like, uh, you know, California State University. So Kinki would be an equivalent to that. But of course, our English interpretation of that word is a little different. It's like, oh, what, what kind of school is this? So the school, I think they've changed officially their name right. in English to, to Their Kindai. name is now, yeah, they're now they're Kindai. So they go by Kindai, which yeah. is great because for the longest time when they're at NAFSA or international conferences, whenever they had to introduce themselves, you know, oh, I'm from Kinki, or I'm from Kinki University. Of course, the, foreign, <laughs> <laughs> the response was always like, Oh, are you? You know, <laughs> so yeah. you know, and then you got to They must have had a billion jokes, to, you know, told about them, and so finally they decided to change the name. And I like the new name, Kindai. It has some kind of you know power, yeah. like Kindai, Kindai. But yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah, regardless of the name, uh, it's a it's a very very uh, highly regarded school. I think a few years ago, it it's a uh, it was the most selective school in the in the country. It had more applications per yes. opening than even Todai or other. It was remarkable. I don't know if that's still the case today, but a few years ago, it was. I'm not sure if they're top anymore, but they're they're it's huge. You know, they get they have a thirty thousand student enrollment, very very popular. It's like a second tier school, and yep. um, it's it's you know they're famous for the um the maguro the tuna their science department. They invented the um what do you call farmed tuna maguro, and they actually have a restaurant down in Osaka where every day it's sold out. I mean, you could go wait in line and then there's somebody at the end with the sign that says sold out, sold out. And every day in a matter of, you know, a few, you know, a few minutes, people wait and it's sold out. Right. But they have a restaurant down there and that actually has um, made them quite famous, the Kingdai Maguro. Yeah. Okay, so that's a little bit about Mike's background. And the topic I wanted to cover for this show is what's happening with international education. Um, so in a word, it, it's a disaster. So many industries have been dramatically impacted by COVID. You think of the airline industry, you think of uh, the tourism industry, hospitality in general. Some have benefited, certainly Zoom that we're using right now uh, has done extremely well. So there are niches that have done well. But unfortunately, education is one of those industries that's been terribly impacted by COVID. And the major reason why is that, at least for Japan, because Japan's been very strict about allowing foreigners to come into the country over the last four or five months, basically it's almost impossible uh, for foreigners to come here as tourists or in any other fashion. And that means that the number of students that we have from the United States in Japan and other countries has basically gone down to zero. 
So Mike, what's your perspective on all of this? And uh, maybe just give your description of what's going on. I know you have, um, you're involved with various committees and so forth that are looking at this and trying to remedy it. What do you think is gonna happen? Well, right now, because it's basically at zero, um, I don't see it getting or improving in the next maybe year or so. And so, you know, the situation is quite dire. And until a vaccine and there's more stability, I don't see students, you know, going out or coming in. And that's put a lot of pressure on a lot of um, like Japanese university schools who have programs that require study abroad. And Kinki University is one of them. And yeah, I they have a program, don't they, where 400 freshmen go abroad? Yes. And the, that, that, you, that's what I'm teaching on that? now. That's what, that's what I'm I, teaching right I, now. Yeah, I kind of guess that that's what you were involved and, in. So, so what it was is the students on their first semester will go, they'll do like a American style ESL under the EOS company um, on campus in, 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 in Kindai. And then the second semester, which is this semester, they were supposed to all go to the United States. And because they, of course, they couldn't go, then they, the, the university created another block of an ESL, so they'll get a year total. And that's why I, I took this position because after um, study abroad, it wasn't going, I thought I better start going back into the classroom, which I do enjoy. And so that's why I'm teaching there. So, but yeah, mm. the promise to send these students abroad is quite heavy on all universities with a requirement that, that to send students abroad. So I'm not sure how they're gonna handle that. Yeah, well, our story at Kansai Gaidai is similar. Um, so in February, the Prime Minister Abe made a declaration that no more classes could be con conducted face to face. I mean, he just announced it. This has to stop. Um, so fortunately for most universities, that's during the winter break. But for our university, since we teach on the Western schedule, we were already a month into our semester with the foreign students. We had about 300 and 10 foreign students that were studying with us for that semester. Um, so we had to flip from face-to-face -face instruction to online instruction, even though the students were still physically located here with us in, in Osaka. Then regarding the Japanese students, uh, we send I think around 12 or 1300 a year to study abroad. And within about four to six weeks, all of them had come back. So the school policy was you have to return because they couldn't predict how this was going to roll out. You know, back in March, April, it was, it's still scary today, but even back then it was even scarier. So those students are, are with us. We have the same problem that Kindai does. What do we do with those students who were under normal circumstances be studying in the United States right now or studying in other locations? So it's, it's a struggle. And, then, and they're not talking about, you know, maybe doing like a virtual study abroad and if they would exchange credits for that, but there's a lot of resistance at different universities. Like I was just talking to Ota Sensei about Hitotsubashi and Hitotsubashi will not accept any kind of virtual, uh, virtual study abroad credits. It has to be physical mobility. So if you define study abroad as physical mobility, then it's really, really difficult. And then the rever oh, one more point on that is that if you do um, study in you know, a virtual study abroad, how much are the students really getting? You know, and then you know you could say, well, it's better than not having any experience, which is also true. And there's also Coil, C O I L. I think you teach yeah. Coil, don't you? Yeah, I've been teaching Coil. I wanted to talk with you about that as well. And there is a um, an initiative sponsored by the Ministry of Education here in Japan and also ACE, the American Council on Education. I'm sure you're familiar with that, Mike, uh, to try and encourage greater COIL collaboration between Japan and the United States. I think but what do you is, think oh, though? I, yeah, what do you think though? It, it may be, I, I don't know what you think, it may be a year or even two before we can regain mobility. I, just for the viewers, uh, you have two academics talking to each other here. This is our own, uh, our professions, our livelihood. But I want you to know that the economic impact of this is huge. The estimate on the amount of revenue that international students bring to the United States, and this would include Hawaii, is $45 billion. And that number is rapidly going down to zero. So this has, of course, a direct impact on people like us that are working within the education industry, but it does affect the overall economy. And, and the other thing too, Mike, that I think about with this is that I was an exchange student when I was a sophomore. So I had that experience as a sophomore. I spent a year at Kansai Gaidai. And these students now that were intending to do this cannot. Right. 
And if this lasts for two years, there's going to be a two year break yeah. for people to have this, this uh, international in-depth experience where they're living in a foreign culture, which has such profound impact on people and affects their career. Certainly that's true for me. My career yeah. unfolded because of my experience at Kansai Gaide. So I think about that in terms of the long-term prospects. If there's two years where we don't have Japanese students going to America and we don't have American students coming to Japan, there's a two where we lose all of those students who perhaps after that experience would develop careers as diplomats right. or businessmen and women right. or working like we do in the education industry. So, so we'll, it's kind of really, tragic when you think yeah, about it that way. It, it is. And we'll never know, you know, what potential was there. And, you know, you know, to, I would say, as you said, I would be looking at somewhere between two and three years. You know, one year would be pushing wow. it, I think. And 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 you don't, nobody wants to hear that because, of course, you know, companies are based on study abroad as well as these students and these programs. But so I'm not sure how they're going to handle it, or they might just start shortening the program instead of. And you know, for Japan, most of the time it was a semester or a year, and even that I thought was never really long enough. But you know, they might make it bring it down to maybe like a month or maybe a you know a couple of weeks, which won't be the same. And as you said, without that life changing study abroad experience, you know, the the path would be totally different. And I really believe I am really really passionate about how life changing study abroad experiences in every aspect of emotional, mental, physical, in every yeah. way. And that's why I feel really, really sad for a lot of these students who can't go in the next couple of years. Yeah. So um, I think we're forced in the situation where we have to teach virtually. So I was mentioning to you before we started uh, the live session here, uh, in the case of Kansai Gaidai, uh, we, we felt terrible for the, we had, 400 students that applied to come to our university this semester, fall semester, that, that started at the end of August. And we had to tell them um, back in April, May, I believe it was, that um, we, we can't get visas for you. So for, the, for those of you that are listening to this, the reason we cannot bring American students into the country is because the government will not issue visas for them to come here. In, in the the thought is to protect Japan against COVID infection and so forth. So we had, our hands were tied. So now we put together um, an extension of our classes, but doing it online. So we have over 300 students, about 60% of them were the ones who were intending to come here face to face that are now taking online courses, including Japanese from us. And we, you know, we have the time shift issue to deal with and, whether we do this synchronously or asynchronously, there's all kinds of challenges. So I, I, I don't know yet about how, if we look at the full immersion experience as 100%, what are we going to achieve with this virtual process? Is it like only 20% or is it 30% or, I, I don't know, I, that, I can't answer that question, but Mike, what do you think? My guess would be, especially for like language classes, like I am, you know, I was doing for the first couple of weeks at Kindai, I would say it's 50% at best. And maybe mm -hmm. if you're doing more like presentation lecture style, maybe that would go up 60, 70%. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you look at the graduate level or you look at an MBA, like a lot of online programs, I think for that level where it's basically just, you know, uh, information, you know, you don't have to have the socialization process or anything. Online probably is fine. It, it probably never reaches the hundred percent, but it's it's fine. But I think for most undergraduates, you know, you know, basically, I think Scott Galloway had said there were three things that um, students go to the university for. One was the reputation of the diploma to graduate. The other was the knowledge and education that you get, and the third, which is probably one of the most important, is the whole socialization, making friends, networking, and that part is totally taken out with right. the, um, online learning. Yeah, we did some surveys of the students in the last sem semester in spring uh, based on the online efforts that we were doing. And again, these students were in Japan, so they were at least living here. And actually, Mike, some of them were quite happy because all of a sudden they didn't have to go to class on a regular basis. So some of my students were zooming in from Okinawa 
<laughs> you can see the palm trees in the background and going, oh yeah, you're not a you're not in Hirakata anymore. I would have hit it better if I were them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some some actually prioritized uh, traveling uh, over classes. We we had some missing student problems as well, but the feedback that we got. Um, uh, the positive things was that the flexibility of the classes and the students were happy with how the professors managed given the circumstances. But there were two things that they mentioned as problems and one that you've just addressed, the, the lack of community in the classroom. Even if you use Zoom and you do breakouts, yeah, it kind of simulates interaction, but it's not the same as when you're mm -hmm. sitting in the room, especially for the cross-cultural engagement between the Japanese students and the, uh, the foreign students in the classroom setting. And the other thing too, and I'd be interested to see if you're seeing this as well, is the lack of discipline and the feeling that it's much harder for the students to stay on track when it's solely an online class. And it's, if you have to be in the classroom twice a week and you're in front of the professor, there's kind of a self-imposed discipline because the professor will, will scold you, or, or I don't know how you teach, Mike, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit tough. So if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'll call you out. Uh, but online, it's uh, I didn't really do that that much, and uh, I think don't think other professors did. Maybe I kind of felt sorry for the students, so I wasn't right, quite. Right. Strict. But as a result, they were saying that it was hard for them to stay on track. I think it's about relationship. Uh -huh. You know, like if you're in the class and you see the students, you have you kind of have a kind of a mutual relationship. You know, you know their name, or you know they know you, and they will show up. But as you said, online, although we have the little names in our little Zoom, right? Like, you know, right. my name is Mike Matsuno. It's still, you know, very different. And we, at Kindai, we went two, two weeks of online in September, and now we just started um, in-person class, and I can tell you the difference. It's like night and day, you know, just. Well, you just did. You did hybrid. Yes. So, 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 so we started. What two was weeks the week. thinking behind that? Why did you start? Well, it, it was part partly to do, and this is, uh, I think, a Japanese university thing where, for the first semester, they had said it would be all online. So even if this program was designated to go on the American calendar from September until December, which is actually a fall semester class, because it was two weeks in September they had to still go online to abide by the university wide rule, which I didn't think was the best decision, but <laughs> right. Wow. So, it's, so not, it's not what's best for students. It was following the rules, right? But then last week we started going online. I mean, in person on, on in the class yeah, okay. and, wow. and I could see the total change. And then, so I'm asking the students all the time about what they think and what they're doing. Of course, you know, you got those few who say, Oh, I'd rather have Zoom because I don't have to wake up as early. Sure, they get up at 845 and nine o'clock class. They're there, right? Now they, they're not up, they're traveling two hours. So it's it's mm. it's totally different. But I can see in their their eyes and their whole emotion is totally different. So Japanese mm. students, especially, I think any, any student would really need to have that in-class experience as much as possible. So you would recommend if uh, going forward that at a minimum universities should do a hybrid model maybe where yes. it's online and then in person because yes. some, some American universities are doing that. Uh, why don't you address the safety consideration? I mean, Mike, are you worried yourself? Now, I, for our viewers uh, in America, uh, I, you know, used to be that Hawaii was what was the exception in that right. the, the infection rates were low. I don't know, still like relative, you compare it to California or New York or other states, it's still quite low. But Japan, the infection rates here for, for reasons that we don't clearly understand. We, I've actually, we've talked about this before in previous shows, Mike. But anyway, the infection rate here is quite low. I, I don't know about you, Mike, but I, none, nobody in my circle, professional or personal here in Japan uh, have become sick from COVID. But when I think about my friends in Silicon Valley, or I have a colleague that uh, worked at a company uh, before I became a professor. He just wrote to me and said his daughter got sick. Uh, he, she was at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which was one of the ones that was a kind of a mess. They had to reverse themselves. So many of my friends and, and colleagues, actually close friends, have gotten sick in America. But in Japan, nobody. So the, the risk, I think, maybe the perceived risk is lower here. So are you... Is the university asking you to take precautions or is it just teaching like normal right now? 
Well, actually, we do have those precautions. We, you know, we have on the first day we give out a bottle of sanitizer to each of the students. We we spread oh. them out. Of course, masks are required, and in the class, and that's one of the reasons that Kindai has done this this kind of split system where only freshmen are on campus Monday through Thursday, and and then Friday oh. we go back online. And Friday, the second, third, fourth year sophomore, junior, and seniors come to campus because they didn't want, they want, wanted to make sure they had some connection back to campus, but they could do Just that. Just one day so they, a week. Yes, for those second, third, uh, fourth year, because they needed the space so that they could spread out the students. Oh, I see. So that's how they do it. So basically, that's clever. Yeah, and they wanted to give it to the freshmen because last this year's sophomores did have their freshman uh, year on campus. They wanted to give it to them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I see that, but I also feel bad for the sophomores and juniors really because they, they really won't have much of a campus life at all. And, and what is, but you know, this group this year, this freshman, I really feel bad because I had them do writing, you know, like they wrote essays about, and one of the topics I wrote was about how has the coronavirus affected you? And there's a lot of, of course, disappointment, frustration, anger, because they get hit the worst. Their mm -hmm. high school graduation, which everyone looks forward to, whether it's in Hawaii or in Japan, mm -hmm. is only them or maybe mm -hmm. a few stu students that their parents come, but it's no friends, it's no big party, it's just them, right? Then they have the big entrance ceremony, which is big in Japan. That's all like, you know, canceled basically, except for a few students who, who attend as, as representatives. So mm -hmm. basically this group got the worst end of the deal and I feel bad for them. I think that's why the university is trying really hard to figure out a plan. How are they gonna get this group abroad? And it's still the $6 million question. Yeah, but if you're right, and I, I think you may be, if it's another two or three years before that can be done safely, I, I, I would imagine even if Kindai or my university said students can go back to America, the parents would probably not yeah. allow it. Yeah, I, I agree. And completely. that's what it comes down to, because the parents, yeah. Yeah. it's it's a little bit different in Japan as opposed right. to the United States. I didn't care what my parents thought. I, I picked the school that I wanted to. When I went to Japan, my, my grandmother, who was kind of a racist, actually, in some <laughs> respects, told me, no, don't go to Japan. I did anyway. I didn't listen to them. But in Japan, the parents are paying for this school, right. and they have a very strong influence, especially the mother, on where the students will go. And you know, the news in the United States is just so bad right now in terms of the virus infection. It, it might... Yeah not even students may choose not to go anyway. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that even if it becomes more or less safe and the vaccine is out, I, I would sense that there will not be a big movement to go and study abroad out. And I think it's because the parents won. And, you know, Japan, they're not risk takers. So mm -hmm. they're more, you know, about safety and security. So a lot of parents will hedge on that as well as some of the parents have either lost their job or lost some of the hours of work. Students who are saving money to pay certain portions of their study abroad at Arubaito part-time jobs, they lost those jobs or have been they cut did, down. Yes. So all of that has been affected. I think what will happen is, although most Japanese want to go to English-speaking Western countries, you're going to have a switch, a different style of, of uh, study abroad and even travel for tourism. I think they're going to stay within the region. I think a lot more people are going to start going toward oh. Asia. And even if it's like the Philippines, for example, which yeah, is Philippines, yeah, some of my Japanese students have gone there on, on two month uh, right. special intensive English programs. And I think even though there's another pocket there, too, that um, of going to Asia, where sometimes Japanese have a little bit of a complex when they're dealing with, you know, um, Western speakers. And, you know, they feel like they're never good enough and all. But in Asia, where both are, you know, it's a second language for both sides, whether it's in Korea mm -hmm. or in China or, you know, um, like, let's say, um, yeah, uh, Malaysia. Well, Malaysia is in the speak English. But so what happens is that they feel more comfortable, more at ease. Then mm -hmm. it's closer in case anything happens. They can come home right away. I think the regional travel for not only study abroad, but tourists is going to be more prevalent than people going far away. So maybe they'll go toward Australia. Um, this is about, what, eight hours, nine hour flight. And Hawaii has a possibility of being a player in this, I think, because it's only yeah. about six and a half hours and nine coming back. So Hawaii could be a big player. I would kind of push that way, you know, you know close enough, the one flight. And then, you know, you can study English and still go back on one flight. Right. Yeah. And I think many Japanese people have visited Hawaii and the parents, 
I, in some respects, sometimes my Japanese students don't know that Hawaii is a part of America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like... I, when, I talk to, yeah, when I talk to them, I treat it like that too, because they do, yeah. right? You know, there's America and then, then oh, have you ever been to Hawaii? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, and, no, I, I've been, I haven't been to America, but I've been to Hawaii. <laughs> and, you know, the, the repeaters are so, there's such an affinity for Japanese to Hawaii. You know, I think it was, I read somewhere it was like 60% are repeaters. So that tells you the, the, the brand that Hawaii has, as well as vice versa. Hawaii people love Japan now. The affinity is so strong. I think when Japan opens up, the Hawaii people are going to be the first in line along with China and Korea and Hawaii. But I don't see mainland Americans or maybe Europeans coming for a long time to China. This is for you know tourism, just because mm -hmm. of the whole Asia stigma and traveling so far away. People are going to travel closer to their home, I believe. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned Australia, and uh, my I have, my friend is the consul general for Australia in the Kansai region, and uh, you know he just says out front that his job is to promote Australia. He's he's kind of like a business person rather than a diplomat although he is very diplomatic as well. <laughs> and the number of Japanese students going to Australia over the last few years has just boomed. Uh, this is pre-COVID, right. mostly because of the politics, you right. know, the kind of the unwelcome, don't yeah. come here, unwelcome yeah. sign that's been put out by the current administration right. <clears throat> in terms of foreign students. So um, their enrollments were dramatically going up. Now they have also, I haven't talked to them since COVID, they completely slammed the door shut. Australia is struggling as well. So they're not bringing in international students. But once that door is opened up again, yeah, they're going to be very aggressively marketing themselves to Japanese students. But let's get back to Hawaii. I, I agree. But, you know, uh, maybe you don't agree with me about this point. I've always been kind of underwhelmed by how little the Hawaiian universities are doing to recruit Japanese students. So I'm, I'm a graduate of Manoa. You are as well, right? Yeah. yeah so I, I have an MBA from Scheidler and um, I've, I've talked to various people on the Manoa campus and it doesn't seem to be all that well organized. It's, yeah. it's like, like the Scheidler, they have their own relationships, right. you know, and they're, they're tied to KO. And then other departments have other relationships and, I, I just don't see it as being well organized or really uh, sufficiently uh, high priority enough to actually generate a positive yes. recruitment effort. And this is true of West Oahu as well, where I've been teaching. And right. uh, they have an international programs department, but it's still quite small and so forth. So there's a community yeah. college and there's KCC yeah. and others. It's, it's Maybe KCC very... is, the, is the most successful one. I'm not sure, but it doesn't seem to be all that successful when you think, like you were saying, that if they did this properly, the Japanese yeah. students would love yeah. coming to Hawaii. Oh, yeah, I completely agree 100%. And what you're saying is right on, and I have experienced it through the last 20 years of working with UH, okay. and it's a silo effect. Everybody has a different silo effect, especially UH. Right. UH people might not like this, but you got study abroad office, you got exchange, you got Scheidler. Everybody has their own, and nobody wants to consolidate. There is no one connecting the dots in, in Hawaii, and that's the problem. And yeah. so you do have a study abroad, you know, Joe Weaver, uh, he, he's in charge and he's great. The problem is on the, the main campus, Manoa, nobody wants to give up their you know, or work together. And so mm. it's like everybody doing, there's a lot of duplication and, mm. and, you know, Hawaii lacks like infrastructure, whether it's housing or, you know, the better transportation, there's no dorms for the international students coming in and there's all, you know, so yes, I would say how in the Hawaii situation is probably 10 years minimum behind what's going on at the more advanced mainland universities. And as you said, I've always been for Hawaii, like, Come on, Hawaii! You can do better than this. And, <laughs> Me too. And it's yeah. like every time I go back, it's like, oh well. Everybody goes, oh yeah, you know that. Oh, like well, shikata ga nai cannot be helped, kind of thing. And I'm going, geez, man, twenty years I've been going back, and I haven't seen very much change at all. And yeah. it's yeah, it's disappointing to me because Hawaii should be a bigger, bigger player. They could be right if they, you know, if they had the infrastructure and support. I'm getting the flashing sign here, Mike. We, we've, believe it or not, we've gone through the 30 minutes already. Wow. So let's just leave it this way. You should work with Kindai. Get them to open up a campus in Hawaii. The Kansai <laughs> guy I had one, as you know, many years ago. I remember, ago. I, I remember. Maybe the building's still vacant. Maybe I can convince uh, 
the leaders of Kansai. Oh, Heine, Heine, right? Yeah. So let's work on that and solve this problem. Mike, it's been a pleasure talking to you. As a, it, Thanks for having me. It's like me. our regular conversation when we get together at the various shows or ACC oh, yeah. events. Really appreciate your insights. This is a, a very important topic for- I really appreciate having me. Thank you very yeah. much, Steve. It's always great to talk to you. It's, you know, we got to have a beer again once. <laughs> That'd be great. Control. Yeah, good luck with your uh, classes at Kindai. You too. Same with online. Take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.